We're going to do a series of one-on-one battles today in the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Fred Zinke and I take a look at like players at like ADPs here on the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast, brought to you by Underdog, The and there's no better place to play Underdog Fantasy, uh, the easiest place to play fantasy baseball, and by Fantrax, uh, where you can receive uh, a, or you can win, enter to win a free official MLB signed jersey from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Go to Fantrax.com slash Rotowire. I'm Jeff Erickson here with Fred Zinke. Fred, welcome. What's going on? How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. How about you, Jeff? You just finished a... Another long day of talking sports. You got you got one more podcast in you. I do, I do. Uh, I actually I pre recorded a podcast earlier this afternoon with uh, Casey Bubba covering uh, the Reds a little bit. Then I did the Sirius XM show. Now doing this, and uh, hey, I'm talking baseball. How can life be bad? That's right. Yeah. Oh, that that Reds one must have been fascinating. Oh yeah, it took up uh, <laughs> 13, 14 minutes, I think. <laughs> Yeah, covering the uh, oh on the Reds topic, Joey Votto is totally not draftable this year. Agreed. I think he's like last, second to last round in a like a, uh, a draft champions or even a fifteen, uh, even like a thirty rounder. I think he is because oh, his playing gosh. time is kind of king, and in NL only, he's definitely draftable. You know, I, I he NL could go only, sure. holes, or he could go Miggy. I think those are like the spectrum of choices there. I mean, he could fade away. Or, you know, he's got talent. He's got skill. I always like to try to bet on those guys a little bit. But, yeah, it's looking pretty grim. (sighs) I'll I'll give you the NL only or the 50 team. But, yeah, in a 30, no way. I was just – when I was doing my projections this year, um, like I actually took them off my list for uh, like a standard 15 team uh, 30 round. Yeah, it's sad. And. Yeah, I I felt bad when I so when I did the projections, I was like, no, I got to project Joey Votto. It's got to be on the list. Like yeah. I got to give him a shot. So I did the projections, and then when I sorted them at the end, he was at the very bottom. So yeah. I so as soon as I had someone else to add, I was like, oh, he's he's off the list. Sad day for Canadians. Sad day. Yeah, hopefully, sad day for me. Hopefully, he has a spurt of effectiveness this year where you pick him up. For the third time today, I'm going to mention he's the only ba- he's that's the only baseball jersey I own is a Joey Votto okay. race jersey. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, I can't believe they're going to start Freddie Freeman over Votto and Team Canada in the WBC. Just an outrage. It's true. Uh, it's all over yeah. the newspapers here. People are, are freaking out. Are they really? No. Okay. <laughs> <think so>. No. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> but, all right. I think if I asked 10 people, 10 friends about the World Baseball Classic, they would say, what is the World Baseball Classic? Uh, that's too bad. Are you that excited is too, about it? It is too bad. Is, am I excited about it? Yeah. <sighs> no. Actually, not really. I'm not a... Like, I'm not an all-star games kind of guy either. Uh, like, I can't wait for the season to start. Like, I can't mm-hmm. wait for the first Blue Jays game. Um, but no, I'm not a... I, I, the World Baseball Classic, like, it would have to be a true World Baseball Classic for me. Where, like, all the best players are there. Like, I can get into those in hockey when they have a true Olympics or a true World Cup where all the best players are there. Then I'm in. Um the Take World a look base- at the Dominican lineup. They're it's there. Really, it's great. It's great. But it's you got to have. Nuts. Yep. But you need the American lineup to be the best it can be. And even Canada's lineup to be the best it can be. I don't know. It, it, it's fine. Like I'll follow the world baseball classic, but for me, it's like, I don't know. I'm not excited. I'm not excited about it because all the best players or not even close to all the best players are playing. Yeah. You need, you need pitching. And that's yep. the thing. It's hard to do. Yep. And this is the thing we've talked about before. There's no good time to host the WBC because right now pitchers aren't up to speed or they're rushing. They're starting early. Teams don't want them to go long into games. If you do it, you don't want to stop the season like the, you know, like two weeks into the, you know, have a two week break in the middle of the season. Uh, although it's kind of funny, like eh, you do that. I, and then you don't, and you, you've done that for other sports and we, you know, we yeah. just haven't done it for, you've done it for hockey, for instance. Yep. Uh, with the Olympics, it's not popular, by the way, in the NHL when they did that. In fact, it was a big issue. In fact, they it, w- it was an issue last time, wasn't it? It was a big problem. Um, yeah, I, I think in Canada, when when they do send the NHL players to the Olympics, it's it's incredibly popular. Mm-hmm. Like that is a huge, like everybody's oh, yeah. on the edge of their seat because you do get all of the best players in every good country 
in the world at hockey, you have all the best players go. Almost everyone goes. Like, didn't they? Didn't so. like the last Winter Olympics? They didn't do that though. They did I... not. That's right. And then yeah. and a lot of people were really mad about that. So because yeah. of I don't know negotiations between the Olympics and the NHL, and I think it was like insurance and things like that. I think the NHL didn't want to do that one too much because of the time right. where the Olympics were and the times of the day that the games would be on. Right. And they felt like the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, but the players really wanted to do it. And they were really upset that the NHL decided not to do it. Like in the NHL, the players like love to go to those best on best tournaments and represent their country. Um, like you said, with baseball, it would have to be, it'd have to be in the middle of the season where pitchers are built up. Right. Routine and, you know, and all the teams would have to agree to let these guys go. You know, and and no team would have to say, oh no no, we're gonna it's it's advantageous to us to hold them back, our best players. So they'd have to let them all go. It would be really cool if we ever did that. Like let's say they took out the All Star game, and instead replaced it with a two week break and did some sort of World Baseball Classic. Like that 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 is something that I would be more excited about. Yeah, I would too. I, I absolutely would. Um, they and- won't stop 162 games, and it's so jammed in as it is mm-hmm. that. It's not happening. Right. And now we've got, and then after the season is, of course, a no, is it just an immediate non starter because they've yep. already accumulated yep. so much wear and tear and so many guys are hurt at yep. that point in time, too. So yep. that's the other reason why you can't do it then. So, all right. Sidebar aside, um, I just thought it was interesting because we're going to start yep. to see, we're going to see reports from that. We're going to see players leave their respective camps and all that. Yep. Right now, we're seeing people report to camp. We're starting to see like Tatis and Sale and, you know, news on Randall Grichik. I think that's like, you know, he's the first like report to spring training injury that we've had. Uh, we, we always get some, but, uh, you know, I get we had some last week, like TJ Antone had a setback. You found out about that. We've had other stuff. Trevor Story obviously was a huge one, mm-hmm. but in, like Grichik is like the first at spring training where they said, oh, well, you know what? He's got the sports hernia and he's going to not be ready for the start of the season. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I kind of, dropped him down in my rankings to me he's still draftable like he still yeah. came in just above replacement level so i think he's definitely still draftable because yeah it looks like right now they're saying unavailable un- likely unavailable for opening day six mm-hmm. weeks of rest and rehab so six weeks puts yeah yeah i i, I only took off 40 at bats i maybe should have taken off just a little more um i took off like they, 15 to 20 percent of his at bats yeah that's a, if I take off, a if I take off a little more, I'm just pulling him up right now. Um, uh, he's still draftable. Even if I took off a little bit more, he yeah. still comes out above replacement level. Like we're still looking at someone who could have enough time to hit about 20 home runs. Um, right. Uh, he's it, a disappointment. It, it, I gotta say, does, I expected more from him. Yeah. And it does. He's only barely draftable. I could see someone saying, especially in a 12, saying forget it in a 15 i think you still draft him because he's at coors and everything but um april is the best time to have bench space available and he's going to jam up one of your bench spots for like let's say you're in an nfbc style league like like tout wars or something unlimited il for sure you draft him in fact he's he's kind of attractive in that because you can stash Mm -hmm. him uh nfbc he's going to jam up one of your bench spots let's say he misses the first three weeks of the season um, yeah, that's just a tough time to, to not be able to put a hot starting pitcher off, you know, someone who starts the season really well, or, or someone who maybe could get saves. It's just, I don't know. It's a waste of a bench spot for someone who I feel like even when he's back, like he'll be usable, but not special. I think the odds that Grichuk is special are pretty low at this point. Agreed. Even with Coors Field. Yeah. Uh, last year I expected more with Coors Field mm-hmm. and it wasn't. More. He, he hit yeah. 259, 724 OPS with a full season there. Remember, he got traded preseason. Yeah. Uh, he actually had fewer homers than the year before in Toronto, uh, about the same slugging percentage. I mean, he's not that good of a player. And nope. this is a point that I made, uh, you know, I, I, ta- I talked about uh, with uh, Bubba, uh, which you'll, people can hear on, I think, Thursday he's going to post. He did, we did a Reds preview and in respect to Will Myers, uh, that a good hitting environment doesn't make a mediocre hitter good or a bad hitter good. Mm-hmm. It makes a good hitter better. You know, it may, may make a mediocre hitter marginally better, but it certainly didn't for uh, Grichik. Uh, that's for sure. Because you also got to realize the road effect on a player like him, it probably is more pronounced that's too. It. 
And that's exactly what happened to him last year. 851 OPS at home, 13 of his 19 homers. Mm-hmm. On the road, 583 OPS. He'd never had that bad of a split. And I really think, you know, Rockies road hitters, I mean, that's a thing. You know, bad hitters become worse when they're Rockies, when it come when it go when they go on the road. I think that it, they get so reliant on the park effects and not on their own skill. Yeah, absolutely. So then you think if you're going to stash him in a 15 team league and you're going to waste three weeks of that bench spot, let's say when he comes back, they happen to go on the road, you know, quite, quite soon after he comes back. Well, now you probably shouldn't even use him. So, you know, if they, if they had a week long road trip shortly after he comes back, like now the three, he's off three weeks, you still don't want to use him for the next week. I don't know. He, he's, so I'm not chasing now into a bigger picture discussion related to Grichuk. I'm not chasing Rockies hitters this year, the same as I have in, in some other seasons, because I expect that lineup to be really, really bad on the road. Yeah. The players exactly. to individually do poorly, but also the lineup overall to not score. And I think v- when they're on the road, there'll be very few Rockies who warrant a spot in your lineup and having to, u- having to hold them for half, their start half the games and most people just use them or I, would oh, I was just going to make that point. Use I, I use them. I yes. mean, I think I find it very hard. First of all, there's the whole, eh, he'll, he'll be fine mentality, but more yeah. importantly though, we, we don't have an infinite number of spots. We don't have an infinite number of replacement yeah. players. We, it's, you know, we got, we've got one injury, one other injury. You got to play Grichik because he's healthy, but guess what? He's going to stink that week. And you know, I, it's easy to say, okay, just bench him in his row starts, but it, it in practice, it's a lot harder to do. And I think I'm with you on that. I think I won't be chasing. We we're talking about Brendan Rogers. Scott and I were on Sunday night and he's just, I'm not really there for him. I mean, he's kind of there. He's fine. I'll, I'm not going to go out of my way to avoid him, but I'm not going to go out of my way to get him just because he's cores and has had some hard hit stats. I mean, I need more. Yeah. Brendan Rogers, another guy like unplayable on the road last year, 218 with three homers. Charlie Blackman's OPS on the road last year was in the 600s. And these things aren't probably going to change this year. Like if they do, it would probably be from luck. And then you add all those guys up. And if they're all posting a six something OPS on the road, then the lineup's not scoring. And right. then you're not going to just, you know, oh, he's not great on the road, but he gets his RBIs and he gets his run scored because they score. They aren't going to score. And they're not a talented lineup and they're, and they're a rebuilding team. So, um, yeah, and, I'm not chasing them. So where I can see these Rockies being a little more appealing to me are in the DCs because you're going to have, in a 50-round draft, you're going to have more depth right. and maybe more options. And maybe in a DC later in the year, you just have to suck it up and play Brendan Rodgers on the road because you've just got injuries. Right. Guys have been ruled out for the season. You're stuck. But at least in the first half of the year, you should have it. If, if you draft your team well, you should have enough other 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 options that you can just sit them for a lot of the road games. Yeah. And the NFPC environment is a little different too, because at least then you can, uh, you, you can do the Friday change. Um, Cause let's face it. The other thing is there, you don't usually get the perfect seven, six or seven home games no. one week, six or seven road games the next week. It's half yeah. and half and things like that. So yeah, it's just, it's hard to optimize. That's, that's the general mm-hmm. takeaway there. Yeah. Uh, Michael Waka is now a Padre. Uh, they, I, I, I'm surprised at this one here because I didn't think they had a spot for him, but apparently they do. Um, and it's just, he, what a great landing spot. If you had Waka in an early uh, DC, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, he, I, he might even be their fourth starter. Now that I look at it there. I just kind of thought, oh, he's like their fifth or sixth starter, but they've got their big three. And then after that, it's kind of less certain. That's right. And we're seeing a report from MLB.com today that the Potters are looking at using a six man rotation um, at the start of the season and, and keeping uh, Nick Martinez and Seth Lugo in the rotation. So uh, the Waka signing for Waka value up uh, this six man rotation. Is it value down a bit for you, Darvish for Joe Musgrove? No, because that's not going to last. Right. I agree. Um, With this and- group, I definitely agree. And they're good. You know, Snell might be a worry point because he doesn't get the innings anyhow. He might be the one guy I'm a little concerned with. I'm going to have to kind of go through uh, on, on my projections for the Padres pitchers because after the big three, it's kind of le- unsettled. Like Martinez yep. and Lugo don't even have like a starting history to turn to. That's the thing that makes it tough. That's right. Yeah, I, I feel like those guys are just, I don't know. I, I don't even, I wouldn't draft either one of them 
in a in a fab league. I, I think I'd just be wait and see 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 how their first starts go. Maybe I claim them. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't think the six man rotation will last. I think just between Waka could get hurt. Well, Blake Snell could definitely get hurt. Martinez or Lugo just may not turn out as starters. Yeah, I just don't see that happening. I mean, I that's what, the, but that, but I have to give them some merit. That is what they're planning. Like the article is very clear on that. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I I will go for Waka though. I, I didn't think I'd have a whole lot of him. I mean, he's kind of an afterthought in a lot of these drafts, but this is ideal because ballpark team behind him, chances mm-hmm. for wins. I mean, this this is this is a yep. good landing spot. I like it a lot. Yeah, I still don't think Walk is very good. Um, like I think he really <laughs> pitched over his head last year, right? For three three thirty two ERA, four oh eight FIP. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's more true to that like a like a four four or four or plus four three point three ERA. I think that's kind of more what he is. But with the park, you know, if I think he could have a four ERA, like four even, strikeout rate's not good, but it's not terrible. Like you said, the team's good. Um, yeah, I could see it. I could see a late round pick on Waka and use him as a streamer. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, sticking with the Padres real quick, Fernando Tati says he wants to play center field. Currently penciled in for right field right now. They're going to move Soto over to the left, over to the left. They've got, they still got Grisham. Adam Engel's on the team too. He can be like a platoon partner with Grisham. Does Tatis get what he gets, what he wants here? Um, and does that matter to you where he plays? Yeah, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if he'll get what he wants or not to me, to me, this one's a bit of a non story from a fantasy perspective, I guess, I guess it's, it's just good that he thinks he can handle playing center field, but mm-hmm. I mean, he's young and really athletic and of course he thinks he can handle center field. I think we're just still, you know, I've heard you talk about this and I feel the same way you do. I I'm leery of drafting to where he's going right now. Yeah. I, I just don't think I'm in. Yeah. I'll be back next year. Yeah, I think that's probably right. What if he starts just killing the ball in spring training, though? I might be back in. <laughs> the, problem, <laughs> the problem is, is so could, because that's one of those, like... And he's running and... Yeah. Right, because there's certain players where I've said, like, it doesn't matter what they do in spring training. So, for example, Jacob deGrom, I'm committed. I'm not moving him up just because he pitches in spring training, even if he pitches well, because I already have him pitching well. I just only have him throwing about 140 innings, which I still feel like is almost a little generous. Um, Mm -hmm. Nothing he does in spring training will convince me that he's going to throw 180 innings. Because that's the whole point is like, I think he will get hurt at some point during the season. So, uh, but to tease, that's a different story because part of the reason like the suspension bothers me, but not that much. If I thought he was full systems go coming into that suspension, then I, then I would be comfortable with him at his ADP. So I do think there's a chance that he could, the thing is, is if he's just hitting rockets in spring training, uh, I'll move him, I'll move him up and I'll be comfortable with him at his ADP, except that his ADP will now move up and he'll yeah. probably be a late first round player or something like that. Sure. Cause we are talking that. about someone who fully healthy, uh, and not suspended, like where does Tatis go in drafts? Probably in the top one, <laughs> top three, something like that. He's in that. He's right. in that top four or five group that we're that everyone's talking about, right? With Turner, Ramirez, Judge, right, uh, mm-hmm. Acuna. Like he's in that group if Tatis was healthy, and he could even be, he'll he would go one one in some drafts. Right, but yeah. the problem is that you have to wait the three weeks. Yep, and then. You, you have to wait even longer to get that. Well, no, actually, I take that back. You may already have outfield eligibility. I, I think he actually does. Right. Um, so I was going to say you have to wait, you know, 10 more games after that to get the outfield eligibility. But I think that's a, I think that's incorrect. Yeah. According to the NFBC, he's listed as shortstop in outfield already. So perfect. That yeah. that's actually a good thing for him there. It is. And with shortstop being so deep this year, uh, I think it's more likely that I would want him in my outfield. Yeah, I mean, it depends. If I drafted him on five different teams, you know, there probably maybe some teams where I use him at shortstop, but I think I would use him in the outfield on most of them. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So, uh, one last note: uh, Chris Sale already starting to throw. Very, you know, very adamant that he's gonna, you know, be. He, he needs to give back. He's made like eleven starts the last three years. Uh, he, he's very determined to be healthy this year. Last year, he had that mysterious ailment with the elbow that was and that it wasn't revealed to be as, you know, that it wasn't initially revealed to be as serious as it ended up turning out to be. Um, 
Is there any chance you could be back in on Chris Hale at pick 150? No, I think I'm, I think I'm not in. Um, he's another DeGrom for me where just because he's throwing this spring. So right now I have him projected for 140 innings. Can mm-hmm. he do anything in spring training that makes me really move that number up? You know, like maybe I move it up to 150 or 155. I just can't see him doing anything in spring training. I don't think it's possible for him to do something in spring training that makes me move it up to 170 or 180. So when he comes, when, when you have him down at 140 innings, mathematically on the SGPs, he doesn't just have, he just doesn't have the volume to right. get up to, uh, you know, a point where I consider him at that ADP. I do see that, know that there's, there is a, a, his 80th percentile outcome, his 90th percentile outcome could be really awesome. Are you interested in that, at that price? I generally often say no here. Um, and I, it, it's served me well the last three years to fade him because it's also the whip. It's also the control. That's a problem too. Um, yeah. Performance plus health. Uh, so probably not, but I mean, I did take him in a DC last year, like the fifth or sixth round. Um, and so <laughs> I, took I, 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 I might be actually. lying to myself by saying yep. no now, or I might be saying I got burned so much never again, you know, and then I forget, Oh, the stove is still hot. Uh, better not touch it, but I, I don't know. We'll see. I probably know. Yeah. As you mentioned, his results have been a little bit all over the place when he's pitched. So going back on him, like 2019, he had this weird 440 ERA where his FIP was like a full run lower. So that was mm-hmm. 2019. Then he missed 2020. And then 2021, he only made nine starts, but he had a 134 whip when he did pitch. And then last year he was good, but he threw five innings. So who cares? Five and right. two thirds innings. Doesn't really matter. Even the, the nine start season doesn't really matter too much, but um even when he's pitched those last four years, the results have been uh, like a little bit all over the place. Like we're not seeing the Chris sale that we saw his first couple of years in Boston or his time with Chicago where, you know, when he's healthy, he's consistently like a three ERA and a, and a whip around one. And the strikeout rate is uh, like, still looks like has the potential. We're just not really sure what we're going to get. I think from him, from someone who's thrown, like you said, 11 starts in the past three seasons. Like we also don't really know, how good of a pitcher I'm assuming he's still really a pitcher, but we don't know that. So I guess that's the one thing in spring training. Okay. I'll come around on that based on how he pitches in spring training, the radar gun readings that might change the ratios that I project him for maybe sure. not the innings, but the ratios that I project him for, which right. still probably doesn't get him up to pick 150 for me, but it would, but it would be something. Yeah. 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 Red Sox are chock full of those guys. I mean, James Paxton, same thing. Yeah. Well, Corey Kluber there. Yeah, he's just making his tour of the AL East at this point in time. Uh, Garrett Whitlock, is he going to, is the transition to starting going to work? He's coming off of an injury. I mean, the, Tanner Houck, what, how are they going to use him? Brian Bayo, he could start the year in the minors. This is just the starting pitchers, let alone like, you know, the, the you know, what are they going to do all stories out? You know, is, is, are they going to actually get anything out of Adalberto Mondesi? And when's he going to be ready? They said he's probably not going to be ready for the start of spring training. I mean, start of opening by opening day. He said being ready for opening day would be a best case scenario. We saw a note, a note on that from Heim Bloom today. But yeah, I, I, you know, there, there's a whole lot of like question marks for this Red Sox team. I do not, I do not like this Red Sox roster at all. Like, no, <laughs> not even a little bit. I mean, maybe they'll hit better than. I guess I can see a path to them hitting better than I expect. Like if Yoshida is good right away, um, mm-hmm. you know, Devers at any point could have an MVP type of season. Maybe Justin Turner turns back the clock a little bit. He's going to a park that's better to hit in. Mm-hmm. Verdugo's fine. Like he's a pretty good player. I don't know. I do not like this. Maybe Tristan Cassis like takes off this year and is, is really powerful. I just feel like it's a lineup that's full of what ifs. It's a rotation that's full of what ifs. Um, it's a bullpen that like is okay. It's a bullpen. That's okay. Not great. It's, it's not a great bullpen, but maybe better than I might like the bullpen better than the rotation or the lineup, but I right. do not like this roster at all. I think I, I think I like it the least of any AL East team. Yeah. And yeah. you're not the only one. I mean, they, yeah. they, they got beat up in their own division last year too. Yeah. Just, just hammered by them. Yeah. All right. We promised one-on-one battles. We're going to give them to you, but first we're going to share a couple of quick notes. First of all, this every podcast in uh, baseball draft season is brought to you by the good folks from underdog. 
The fantasy baseball season is underway, and there's no better place to play than Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy baseball. Right now, Underdog has MLB best ball tournaments live, including the Dinger, which has $500,000 in total prizes. In best ball, all you do is join a contest, draft your team, and that's it. There are no waivers, no trades, and no in-season management. Draft 20 rounds of players and get the best cumulative scores in your starting lineup. Three pitchers, three infielders, three outfielders, and one flex. Talked with Mike Alexander about that last week, about some, you know the vagaries of that uh, of their system and why outfielders are going so early in uh, underdog leagues. You can check that out. Check out that podcast from last week. Getting started is simple. Go to underdogfantasy.com, sign up with the promo code RWMLB, and not only will Underdog double your initial deposit up to one hundred dollars, but you also get six months of our RotoWire subscription for free. Again, that's Underdog Fantasy promo code RWMLB. Draft your hundred thousand dollar dinger team today. Also, uh, all of our podcasts and draft season are brought to you by our good friends at Fantrax. If you don't want to play best ball and you want to run your league, guess what? They have the most customizable platform in the industry, offering the greatest fantasy experience for your dynasty keeper redraft and even best ball leagues. Yes, you can do those there too. Coming from another service, Fantrax makes it easy. Fantrax can import any of your current leagues and customize if needed. Fantrax offers the most in-depth player pool in the industry, including minor league players. Do you need a customizable commissioner service for your fantasy league? Fantrax offers more customization than any other platform. Waivers, categories, scoring system, schedule. Fantrax offers custom solutions for all that and more, and it's all free. Sign up for free today and be entered to win an an official MLB signed jersey from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Simply go to Fantrax.com slash rotowire and sign up today that's f-a-n-t-r-a-x dot com slash rotowire fantrax the home of fantasy sports we thank underdog and fantrax for sponsoring us we also thank blue wire and we're on the blue wire network here are their brief ads thank you for your indulgence and uh all the uh, us paying the bills there to help be able to afford to p- uh, pr- provide these podcasts to you all week long uh, and all draft season long. All right, it's time for one-on-one battles, Fred. You drew up a bunch of battles here. Let's jump right into them here because I like this idea a lot. Uh, similar players at similar spots. Our headline guy was Cedric Mullins. And you asked Cedric Mullins or Adelise Garcia. Uh, two toolsy outfielders. Uh, recent breakout seasons, Mullins two years ago, maintained a pretty good year last year afterwards. And Adelise Garcia who kind of surprised people. He was kind of, you know, we had the whole question, who is this year Cedric Mullins? Well, it's Adelise Garcia. Uh, so who is the one that you're going to be more willing to get this year? Uh, 48 for uh, Cedric Mullins, 52 for Adelise Garcia, and ADP over the last three weeks. What say you, Fred Zinke? I'll go with Mullins. I just, the low on base percentage for Garcia just worries me a bit. Um, I was pretty down on Garcia last year, and I was wrong, so... I guess I'm willing. <laughs> Here we go. I'll be wrong again. Um, but I just that low on base percentage just means that to me means that if he goes into a slump or gets off to a poor start to the season, um, the numbers could be really bad. Right. Like last year was a 300 even on base the year before mm-hmm. it was 286. Like he, to me, he's just someone where if he had some bad, bad of ball luck for a while, that on base percentage could be like 270 or something, 260 and then be, look really bad. So for that reason, I think I'm going to go with Mullins. I know there's a little more power with Garcia. Um, maybe I feel a little, I think I also feel a little better with Mullins as a base dealer. Well, he, he has been a better base dealer. And I just think that fits his profile a little better. So maybe, and maybe he's even a little bit better positioned to take advantage of the stolen base rules. I don't know, but I feel a little bit better with Mullins. What, what about you? I do too. Uh, and this is someone who had Garcia in a couple of leagues. I got him in okay. Ale Tout Wars, which was beautiful. The rest of the team was not as beautiful, but hmm. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of K's there. Uh, the, the Rangers lineup should be better. I think marginally better. I think they're one hitter better than they were last year. Right. Um, I still think the bottom third of the lineup is pretty bad. Uh, and that, 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 that is limiting in terms of counting stats, him scoring runs, someone knocking him in, getting around to him a little bit more often. This mm-hmm. is, these are things that are concern. Uh, that said, I, I could see maybe, excuse me, I could maybe see him uh, being someone that 
you know, I, you know, if he, if he, I thought he'd actually have a lower ADP to be honest. And then people would be, you know, cause people are like, Oh, he's totally a regressor. Right. And I thought he'd be like at pick 80, but he's not. No, I think he's, I think Garcia's price kind of, kind of fairly, like I don't hate the pick where mm-hmm. he goes. Um, I won't have any shares. I just won't. I think I could see me having some Mullins shares just depends on the both of them pick early, are picked early enough that it kind of depends on your draft slot. Like, sure. like for example, when we pick in labor uh, on next Tuesday, plug for the show when we when we do our live labor yes. pod next Tuesday, uh, I just don't think it'll work out where I'll I will have the option of either one of them. I think they will be gone by the time I pick on the four or five turn. Just kind of knowing that group, that room and what it's usually about. So. Um, if Mullins was there, for example, on the four or five turn, I would, I would love to take him. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. I hear and, and I won't take him at the start of round three. I just, I, I'm not that into him. So yeah, I there, think there, there, yeah. there's a drop off uh, at wide, at, at out, I said wide receiver at outfield <laughs> uh, there. I mean, after Mullins and Alex Garcia, I mean, and, and Schwarber's in that range. And so is Luis Robert, but then you have to, at least according to ADP, you go all the way down to like 67, 68, where you find Eloy and Teoscar. Uh, Corbin Carroll's right after that and George Springer. So you can see there's, there, there, there's a kind of like, okay, if you don't get him, you're definitely committing to waiting to get, get a tools, the outfit, which is fine. Right. You know, you don't have to have that there, but at the same time, it's like, he's kind of the last of that category. At okay, least so, in that range. So let's add to this. Let's throw Luis Robert in. I'm not going to throw Schwarber in because he's kind of his own entity. And he's a different player. Yeah. Yeah. L- let's throw Luis Robert in. What do you think about him versus Mullins versus Garcia? Uh, I think I'd go Luis Robert over both. Um, I think there's a cons- although it's it's frustrating. So obviously there's a lot more volatility I think with Robert than there is with th- than with Mullins. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not obvious. Uh, I think it's obvious, but just because the health the health concerns. I just think the raw ability is just off the charts though with Robert. And he this is a guy who was going in the first round in some drafts last year. Yep, I, yeah, I don't think absolutely. he's. I don't think he's getting discounted for performance. He's only getting discounted because he was hurt so often. Uh, yep. Yeah. Last year, I mean, his his OPS last year is seven forty six. That's like man. yeah, but he played hurt, right? He did for sure. So I, yeah, I think he's better than that. His career OPS so far in two hundred twenty two games is eight oh eight. Uh, that does make him a better hitter than Garcia or Mullins. I think I would be Robert too. The only reason I might be Mullins again, it would depend what I've come out of the first few rounds with, like, let's say I started, uh, let's say I had Jordan Alvarez. So maybe I needed a little more steals. Uh, maybe I took Alvarez in round one, then maybe I'm Mullins. If I, if my initial hitter picks were balanced, then I think I would take Robert. Like By the way, said, the upside yeah. with Robert is, is really tantalizing. If, if he had a healthy season, it would be, he could, he can go to a place that Mullins can't go to. I'd agree with that. Yeah. By the way, uh, while we're doing these one-on-ones, um, if you have one that you'd like, and you're you're watching us live, you're streaming with us live. Thank you for staying up late. Appreciate you. Uh, post in the comments. We'll, we'll address it. You know, keep it on point. But you know, if you've got your own one-on-one that you want us to resolve, uh, you think is an interesting discussion point, bring it up. We'll talk about it there. Uh, let's move on to the next one because uh, we got a lot of them. Fred Fred dug in and got some good ones here. So. Uh, Boring veteran Luis Castillo or rising star Christian Javier. I like how you just, you know, <laughs> I, I think this is one of those false, like head. This is like one of these pump fakes that you, you really don't feel that way. Uh, you're trying to post it that ADPs are 59 for Castillo, 62 for Javier. Um, I'm going to go first on this one. Cause you kind of okay. jumped in last time. I, I'm going to go Castillo here. Uh, and it's because I think I'm a, I'm a little afraid of the Astros going six man and having, although Mariners have done that too in the past, but I think Castillo will get the innings. Now it's weird because I'm not usually on Castillo because of the whip, but I think he's a different pitcher a little bit now. I think he's past the shoulder issues that have dogged him in the past. And he's just on a better team and a better ballpark. Uh, and I, I, I think that's going to help him a little bit more. I'm going to go Castillo here over Javier. Uh, it, it's not easy because I think Javier is awesome, but I just I think there's a I want to see another year from Javier before I take him over this this grouping here. Yeah, this is a tough one for me. So my projections say Javier. I would probably take him, um, but my 
like inclination is everything you said is just to take the safe guy with mm -hmm. Castillo. Now Castillo's never been like a massive workhorse. Like he has a, he did get to 190 innings one year with the Reds when he made 32 starts. And then another year with the Reds when he made 33 starts, which pitchers don't usually get to 33 starts. He got to 187 innings. So when I'm looking at his innings, like he's not a super deep into games type starter. Like last year he started 25 games through 150 innings. So even if you throw five more starts on at his rate, like, so you can kind of project him for 180 innings, maybe 185, but you can't really, which is a lot nowadays, but it's not a really high amount. Um, Christian Javier, I'm not going to project him for that amount of innings, but he doesn't need to throw that amount of innings to reach the same or better strikeout total than Castillo. Like for example, Javier last year, uh, 25 starts, five relief appearances, 148 innings. I think so. Projecting Javier for 165, okay, to me seems like it could happen. Um, Christian Javier for 165 or Luis Castillo for 185. You probably get more strikeouts from Javier. Um, like you, you know, said, Castillo's sure. not a big whip guy, so maybe you get a right. better whip from Javier. I don't know. I I I think I would take Christian Javier. Although I totally everything you said makes me nervous and I could have this dilemma uh, next Monday or next Tuesday night because I'm on that turn. And that's kind of where those guys are often going. I don't think you're on that turn. I think you're on the five. Aren't you on the you're, wait? You are on no, the, I'm on the turn. pick 60. Yeah. Turn, right? You like, can get, but why not both? Right. Well, it would depend maybe. Yeah. If I've already had it, if I already have a starter or, um, or, or yeah, how I want to shape my team, but yeah, I think I could have this dilemma. And like I said, on my projections, because of the better strikeout rate, uh, Javier comes out ahead for me, but not by a lot. And there's mm -hmm. just that part of me that thinks maybe when push comes to shove, I just say Castillo's pretty consistent, solid pitcher on a good team with a good park. I don't know. And Javier, like you said, like I don't think Christian Javier is a flash in the pan, but he's certainly far less proven. I, I'm kind of pulling back from my original uh, my ri original uh, conclusion. I think I might actually be on Javier more than I thought I was. Yeah. Projections certainly say I am. I, I, uh, I just think, like I said, like a, f a few more strikeouts, probably a better whip. ERA is going to fluctuate. They'll probably both be pretty similar. Um, wins, who knows? Maybe I have Castillo an extra win for a few more innings. But, but Javier also plays for a, a great team. Like not just a good team, a great team with the Astros. So, um, I, it's it's pretty even. Yeah, I don't know. And also, either one of them could have a really special season, and I wouldn't be shocked. Castillo, right. I do think maybe at some point could put together a season where he does go deeper into games. Maybe does throw two hundred innings one season. I do think either one of them, and Javier obviously could have a special season if he could get up to say one hundred and seventy five innings. Maybe he gets up two hundred at that point. Maybe he gets up to two hundred and fifteen strikeouts or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm now kind of like I'm walking this back a little bit here. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, it's a tough it, one. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm actually gonna. I think he. I, I may have over promoted his. Uh, over uh, projected Javier's strikeouts a little bit because he's not going to be doing any relieving. Oh, uh, this year he's gonna. So maybe he has to preserve himself a little bit more. Would you be comfortable with these two as your number one, two, ace and number two, double tap? Yeah, I, I would. Aces. I would. I mean, the differences between the AL and the NL are getting lesser and lesser um, yeah. in terms of like, yeah, you always got to get NL pitchers. Well, the schedule's balanced now the schedule, and yeah. the DH is in both leagues. And so we're getting away from that. That's another thing, by the way, when we, we were talking about like how our pre, you know, prior year's data is not that great. Mm -hmm. Like 2019, we still had, we didn't have the universal DH. Where yep. and, and in 2021, we didn't have the universal DH. We, had, we only had it in 2020, right? And then, yep. and then 2022. So I, well, we're, we've thrown out 2000, we've kind of thrown out 2019 when we're doing three year weighted averages, I guess, by now, too. So, but point being is it's still skewed data a little bit. That's one other thing we still have to account for when we're going back on everything. So, yep. yeah, kind of going back and forth on that one there. So, uh, I want to revisit that one in a second, but uh, yeah, but that that's that's one where I, I kind of want to take another look at my projections on both guys uh, there and see see maybe. Darn it, Fred, you make me. Think yeah, this that. one's a tricky one. Like Castillo's never had a season where he's posted like an elite whip. Like mm -hmm. he's had a, a 107. Um, no, sorry, a 108. He had a 107 as a rookie in in half right. a year, but he had, he had a 108 last year. He's just he's never had that. Javier had it last year. 
and he's right. just getting his feet wet in the majors. So, um, yeah, I don't, I've always been a Javier fan. It's just, that's a lot like that could be your SP one. If you wait and double tap them, uh, Javier just as your ace, I don't know. It does feel risky for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so funny. In my memory, Castillo had this nasty like stretch of uh, teams he faced after going to the Mariners okay. and it did start Yankees, Yankees. Then he had a Angels start, but they had Oakland, Cleveland twice in a row. Okay, th- that's actually legit, but Cleveland wasn't that good nah, in the lineup. Yeah, and that Angels team was pretty decimated by that. Yeah, they, they were awful offensively. He had yeah. two more Oakland starts in there, a KC start, but he did have a San Diego start. It's just like, oh, it's murderer's row, but it really it really wasn't. But You're right, kinda... three, three Oaklands. <laughs> yeah. Three Oaklands in, I think it was 11 starts, and then, like yeah. you said, you throw in a Kansas City, yeah, not that not not there are some hard ones in there but it probably averages out to a pretty normal schedule right exactly yeah. all right we moved we spent a lot of time on this one let's move yeah. on to the next one here uh catcher adley rushman or sal perez rookie versus boring vet rushman's at 58 perez is at 61 same range i didn't even have to scroll this time thank you for that appreciate you yeah no problem uh, again, you see me zeroing in on draft dilemmas that I might have. Another one yeah, weird, my- strange. Yeah. yeah, thanks for helping me prep, everyone. Uh, I'll take Sal Perez. It's close for me. Um, this one is another one where, like, I like I like Adley Rushman long term, um, but I think for now he's still a young catcher. We've still seen young catchers have some growing pains, be volatile. I think I'll just, again, there's a little roster construction here because Rushman can get you some steals. Perez isn't going to do that at all, but I think I'll take, I'll just take Perez. What about you? Comfortably Perez. I yeah. love Rushman, but I think Perez gets more playing time um, yeah. because he's going to DH whenever he doesn't catch and he ca- yeah. he plays more than anybody else. Anyhow. I think that's the difference right there is just the playing time. And the power. I, I need yeah. to see it from Rushman first. I mean, you yeah. could you could be doubled up in power from Perez to Rushman. So and I love that. I mean, if this is an OBP league, well, okay, we'll have that discussion. But until unless you play in that sort of format, mm-hmm. I, I think it's it's I'm comfortably Perez on this one here. Right. Yeah. I yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, one thing about Rushman that was really impressive last year, 70 runs scored in 113 games. Um like that's for a catcher. Holy moly. 70 runs in 113 games like that projects out. If he plays a little more this year, like if, if you could get from Rutschman 80 something runs, that would be really impressive. But yeah, I'm with Perez. For me, it's just the playing time. If I put them both to the same number of plate appearances, I think they'd be even, or maybe Rushman could even be out ahead, but I just don't think that's where we're headed. I think we're headed to Perez getting more plate appearances. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Yeah, I think that's right. All right. That was an easy one. That was easy. Gives us time to get on another one here. Tyler Glass now, Boomer Bust or Sleepy Joe Musgrove? Why do you call him Sleepy Joe? I just actually threw that in as just a joke because. Okay. I thought there was a a nickname I didn't know about or something. That was my attempt. That was my Canadian attempt at American political humor. Didn't. Oh, okay. Now I get it now. Duh. Yeah. See, it shows how politically attuned I am. And and maybe Joe Musgrove is a little sleepy in the sense that I think we've kind of, he's good. But we've kind of reached, I think, where we are with him. Like, mm-hmm. like opinions on Tyler Glass now are all over the place. Sure. Joe Musgrove now, he's a 30-year-old pitcher who's had almost identical seasons two years in a row, uh, both years of the Padres. I, I just feel like in projecting Musgrove, it feels pretty easy as far as, you know, I, like, actually, I don't know if he'll totally match. I don't think he'll match his stats last two years just because of some of the rule changes. He's pretty fortunate on batted balls. But, but again, like, I'm probably going to project him for a whip around, I don't know, 114, something like that. Maybe an ERA around 3.4, 3.5. Um, I don't know. I just feel like he's pretty easy to project, whereas Glass now is one of the hardest players to project. Right. I'll take Must- Musgrove, by the way. And yeah. I'm not, not even thinking twice. Yeah, I mean, Glass now could be a top five pitcher. Musgrove cannot. Yep. Um, but Glass now could throw five innings. <laughs> also, yeah. that's also possible. Uh, and so I get it there. Glass now still hasn't his career high is 111. Um, he'll turn 30 years old during the season. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just can't. See, I can't see me passing up someone who's had the seasons that Musgrove just had two years in a row. He's on a good team, pitcher friendly home park. I just don't see me passing someone like that up for. Right. And for you're that. looking at that as the end of the sixth round as one of your, if you don't get two pitchers at the 
four or five turn, you're looking yep. at getting one there. So yep. I see what you're doing, Zinke. Yep. I see what yep. you're doing. Yeah. All right. Getting trying to uh, get Mapping ahead up on me here. Yeah. Let's this keep is down. where my idea came from, by the way, is trying to map out my draft and just, yeah. and then I did dive in. Some of these are not related to, to our labor draft. They're just interesting ones that I thought of, but when I was looking at ADP, but yeah, that's where it starts, right? Because you need to, when you're mapping out your draft, you need to guess on some of these debates that you're going to have and try to really dive into them and sort them out before you're on the clock. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to skip, uh, I'm going to skip the Mariners because the next yeah. Mariners pitchers. You guys covered some on. of this yesterday. You and Scott did. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's go to a couple outfielders. Allegedly, no, I've heard on fancy baseball Twitter that nobody's talking about Taylor Ward. So Taylor Ward or Stephen Kwan? Uh, actually, everybody is talking about Taylor Ward. That's the joke. I get it. Um, um, now I just spoil the joke, but because uh, I'm good that way, I'm like an old uncle that explains jokes now. But uh, all right, Taylor Ward is going at like one thirteen. Uh, I, I missed out on getting Stephen Kwan, so I suffered the wrath of Kwan. Uh, last year uh so taylor ward 113 kwan 117 who do you got this one's really close for me i i feel like these two are linked in that they were both fab darlings at the start of last season yeah um and then both were inconsistent in different ways kwan was maybe a little more consistent ward was like really good and then really not good and then late in the season good again um I'm going to, well, the cop out would be roster construction, but I, I think all things being equal, I guess, uh, I guess I'll take Ward. It's uh, really I, close for me. It, it would be a bit of a roster construction thing because I think Quan could get me 20 steals, whereas Ward probably gets me about a half a dozen. And then I think Ward could get me 20 homers, whereas Quan probably gets me about half a dozen. And maybe mm -hmm. like the batting average a little better with Quan, um, but maybe the overall runs in RBI is a little better with Ward. This one's really close for me. It's close for me too. Um, I, I Yeah. If you need batting average, I'm going Quan. Mm -hmm. If you need power, any power at all, you're going Ward. Both are in my top 100. I have both above ADP. So um, yeah, I, I, I like them both. I, I, I would like shares of both. I think Cleveland is kind of a rising offense. I think the Angels are a better team than they were last year. Duh, they have to be almost. But um, I, I, I do think that they made reasonable strides in improving that lineup and built in a little bit of depth. So when they get the eventual Anthony Rendon injury, well, they got Gio Urshela instead of a shell of a player instead. <laughs> well played. Thank you. Um, Thank you. One thing with Quan, I want to believe that the batting average is locked in because – the strikeout to walk rate is so good, mm -hmm. but he is someone who has like really low barrel rates. His yeah. stat cast XBA last year was only 268, which I get because they're so he's making hard contacts so rarely. So yeah, I I feel like when I look at the strikeout to walk rate, I'm like, oh, this Quan guy, he's going to be a batting average, you know, reliable batting average guy going forward. I I'm not totally convinced of that. Like I want to believe that. And, mm -hmm. and I projected him for a good batting average. I didn't project him for anything like the 268 he had on stat cast with his XBA, but that is in the back of my mind. Like I, I was projecting him actually, when I initially projected him, I had his batting average up closer to 300. And then the more I dove into the low barrel rate, the XBA, I did lower it down to more something in the two eighties. That's fair. Yeah. Which I think, and I, it could be a little bit lower, but I'm going to leave it in there for now. What about the shift rules? Uh, does that ratchet the batting averages back back up a little bit? It could, and I I don't remember how much. I have a chart looking at how much different players were shifted on. I don't remember one for him. He is a left-handed hitter, so I would think he'd be one of the least shifted left. I think hitters so too, because his because ability just to slap it the other way. Yeah, his opposite, like his pull rate is lower than his rate of going to the opposite field, so he probably wasn't that impacted by that. Yeah, um, he kind of is what he is. He's a he's a soft hitter who makes a lot of contact. Yeah, and can and can get on base pretty well because of it. We often wait on first baseman to find some power, and this year is no different. We can get some guys in the middle rounds. You got a trio of first basemen: Reese Hoskins, Christian Walker, or CJ Crone. Yeah, this one's a tough one for me. I'm gonna go with. Hoskins. 
This is also – this is you just like – mapping out all of your picks again it's this way. one's not actually i just really so i could have done a first base but there's so many first basemen this year that mm-hmm. when i was picking out these battles i could have made i could have made this whole sheet just first base battles at various okay. ADP points there's so many of them um i just i just zeroed in on this one to, to grab one um i pick i'll go with hoskins um i just think i know crone we already talked about rockies and the, the road problems with having Rockies this year, uh, that that plus, you know, there's a decent injury history with Crone. I, like, I'm not down on Crone at all. Um, like, like, but I just don't think I want to necessarily chase him. And then mm-hmm. Walker, like Walker was really good last year. And I drafted a lot of Walker last year just because he was so cheap and coming off that bad 2021 season. And he had playing time. And he was good, like really good last year, 36 home runs. It's just he's been a little all over the place in his career. So I think, I think for that reason, I feel like what he was last year is Reese Hoskins, right? Except Reese Hoskins basically does it every year. Like every year, Reese Hoskins hits 240 something with about th- about 30 home runs. I feel like Walker was a little better than that last year, 36 home runs, but basically he was reese hoskins last year about 30 yeah. home runs 240 something batting average so i'd rather just take hoskins who does it every year and the phillies lineup's better yeah uh the thing about walker is like he struck out a far less than he used to mm-hmm. um and that's actually a skill growth thing i would think it's not like babip where it's yep. like it's you know you, you don't run the vagaries of strikeouts at least i don't think you do nope. um nope no, he deserves credit for that. I would take him second out of them. And again, I'm not down on Crone, but I just, I think I would take Walker second. What do you think? You haven't given me your final answer. It's Hoskins for sure. And I okay. haven't decided between Walker and Crone. I mean, I, I think they're they're yeah. kind of, they've always been grouped together, Fred. I mean, I always think, yeah. of, you know, and they kind of emerged about the same time. Crone actually yeah. was drafted a lot earlier than Walker last year. Uh, but I always, in my mind, I always view them like similar, similar career paths where they had to bounce around a little bit. Mm-hmm. And well, Walker only had two teams, but he took a while to get be an established full time yep. regular. Same thing with Crone; he's found his home in Colorado, got the finally got some job security for the first time in his career, and, and I think good things can happen with that. I he's the guy. Crone does get help by Coors Field. I think that's the, I think compared him versus like Grichik. And Crone actually, I think, is good enough of a hitter that he actually gets helped by uh, Coors Field. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, he did have all the splits, so that we were talking about with the other players. So six nineteen OPS on the road. He oh. hit two fourteen with seven home runs in seventy seven road games. That's way so, worse than I thought it was. Un- be. Unplayable. I think. Again, I actually, if I'm debating between Crone and Walker in a best ball, or sorry, yeah, in a best ball or in a draft champions, mm-hmm. I'll take Crone. And I'll work around the road games, um, and yeah. because the because the flip side of that is, if I could nail all the home games, well, I only needed to nail the home games to get 22 homers and a 302 batting average last year. Right. That's like so. I'm getting most of his stats in half the games. Um, but yeah, but um, if I'm if Hoskins had a pretty big split too. Did you realize that 885 at home, 706 on the road, okay. 12 homers though, uh, 231 batting average. So 31 on RBIs road, on the road. Yeah, not good on the road, but not unplayable. You know, and in his right. career, it's the same. It's it's not uh, in his career. Hoskins on the road, 794 OPS. He's hit 227 in his. Career. So last year was like an extreme version of that. A little bit, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but but in his career, he's 100 points higher at home than on the road. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right, let's uh let's hit one more here. Um, we haven't done a whole lot of bullpen talk yet, so let's hit one of those. Mid-round relief pitcher, Pete Fairbanks, Paul Seawald, or Andres Munoz? Two Mariners and a Ray. I think you did this on purpose. Just in case I'm thinking about these guys. Well, no, more so that they're, you know, annoying franchise. Good, but annoying franchises. that's it. You know, in terms of trying to pin down who's going to get a save, I don't think it's going to be just one. Oh, uh, yeah. It won't be just one, and it won't even be just on those teams. I don't think it'll be just two. So yeah. I will go with Fairbanks because I think I feel uh, this. Do I feel the safest about him? I have Andres Munoz just a little bit ahead of Fairbanks in my projections, but Munoz is, he's someone I'm going to watch in spring training, right? Because he's coming off the foot injury. Um, 
he could be my answer by the middle of March. Right now, I think I would take Fairbanks. Right. Um, Seawall, I'm going to put in third. But I'm going to say on all those teams, on both those teams, like the Mariners will have those two relievers plus Diego Castillo will probably get some saves. We know what the Rays are going to do. Fairbanks is going to get some saves. Jason Adams is going to get some saves. Seven other guys are going to get at least a save. <laughs> That's the way it's going to go. Yeah. So right now I have all three of those pitchers at fewer than 15 saves. Yeah, I have fair. I have Munoz at 18. Okay. I have Fairbanks, I think at 20. Munoz, there was a note on him today through a bullpen session today. Now he, right. uh, he had surgery two weeks after the season on his ankle. Mm-hmm. Uh, Seawalt also had, uh, work done, uh, yep. in the off season. So, but and meanwhile, Fairbanks was the healthiest of the three. So that, that that's a starting point, but yep. Munoz was immobilized for 12 weeks, six in a cast, six in a walking boot. His ankle was immobilized. Not he, in, his entire body was not, <laughs> he was not in a cocoon. Uh, he was not in a Han Solo sort of cast, if you will. But, uh, he did, you know, he he got the work done right after the season, two weeks after the season. So it was good there. It began the throwing program or before getting the spring training. Now he's got doing mound work already. So that, I'm I'm pretty encouraged by him. I mean, he's electric. He is, but so is Fairbanks for that matter. All three of these pitchers are really good. Um, I, I'm inclined to get them, any one of them actually. Mm-hmm. I say that now, but the ratios play and. Theoretically, you're going to get some wins and K's at least going through that. This is these are the type of guys you roster so that you know you, you don't have to start that marginal fourth starter because he's got a two start week or or, or a, a bat or a fourth starter on a one start week and you're just like eh, you know this is yeah. you you start these guys and you you protect your ratios and you get some goodies too along with it. Yeah, Seawald in this group is third for me because Agreed. because his. Uh, strikeout rate dropped a lot last year. So mm-hmm. he threw almost the exact same amount of innings two years in a row, but he struck out 32 fewer batters last year. That's a big drop off. Um, his num- his numbers last year were really helped by a 159 BABIP. And even for a good reliever, like that is probably not sustainable. So like his FIP last year was, was 382. So, which is not good for a reliever. So I just think, I think Seawall will be good. I am not saying that he's not, but there was just a little bit of concern there. That's more so than the other pitchers. Um, yeah. Like I said, I just feel the best a bit about Fairbanks. Could the Rays ever buck the trend and actually go with a closer? They have done it in the past. They just don't usually, but right. I, I think we've gotten to the point where we just assume the Rays will never have a real closer. Mo- it, that's the smart money, but there'll probably be one year. In the next There's years been where, some years. There I'm have been. Think, that's what I mean. There'll probably be a year where someone gets 27 saves or something on the race. Uh, now I'm not 40, but um, I Jason Collette was making that point that they, you know, uh, Dio Castillo actually had a decent save year yeah. one year. So it's not even that long ago. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm going to go Fairbanks. I like Fairbanks. I think he's a really good pitcher. I think that the fact that some of his competition has dropped off due to injury, I think also helps him a little bit. Eh, I, I think I'll, I think I'll have Fairbanks in a league or two. I think, I'll, I think I'll have some Munoz too. Um, yeah. Maybe Seawalt starts to get discounted a little bit. I don't know. Cause I, I feel like Munoz is a little ascendant uh, that some people are talking him up. So I think he might have this helium and that might provide that Seawalt's the bargain. So, I mean, Seawalt's really good. Yep. It's just, I, I, trust the Mariners. I mean, I think that I don't, I trust the Mariners less. That's not true. I, I can't trust anyone less than the race. <laughs> yeah, I just you can trust both. the Mariners. Equally oh, I can trust the, I can trust David. I can trust David Bell the least. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, he, he's in the, I, I won't be having Alexis Diaz at his cost, even though I know like there's no TJ Antone for at least half the season. Yeah. I'm still probably yep. not going to pay cost for Diaz. And then with the Reds, there's that whole variable too of how many games are they going to win? True. Right. True they, that at least with the Mariners and the Rays, like you're looking at two teams that should win about 90 games or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're at an hour. Um, want, anything you want to ta- uh, say before we sign off? Um, big labor draft next week. I will say without getting too much into my draft planning that as I started to go through the draft plan. I really don't want to be on the turn this year. We don't have to make that a long discussion, but mm-hmm. I feel like closer runs 
obviously is not it's not good to be on the turn but this right. year with the deep pool of starting pitchers i think i would rather sit in the middle and be able to so i hear a lot of people say with starting pitchers um you know i'll just wait until that group thins out and then i'll take one well you can't really do that if you're on the turn because, yeah. <laughs> because there's 30 picks right in between that's right almost 30 picks in between when you pick so you can't wait you've got to just pick one so you can't play that game i want to play that game so I don't want to have to reach. And I, wouldn't, I don't want to be on the other turn either. I think this year, I don't know if I want to be right in the middle. I think I'd love to be like fifth. Mm -hmm. um, if I can't be fifth, then I think maybe I wouldn't mind just falling down to like 10th or something. But I don't want to be on the turn. That When I started playing at my draft, and it's in it to me, it's always a thing with closers. And this year, it's a thing with starting pitchers too. All right. Where I can't, uh, I can't play the drop-offs. I'm always that way. I always yeah. prefer the middle. Uh, it, you know, there, there's reasons, you know, like if you're optimizing for the first round, say, okay, give me fifth. I like fifth a lot. Uh, but general draft structure, give me right in the middle. I, I'm, I'm in my happy place drafting eighth where I'm at in this draft. Um, there, there are certain ones I may not want to have to take in the first round or something, but mm -hmm. you can always find a good player first of all. But, and then I, I just, for the reasons that you stated, I love being in the middle. Yeah, there, there's also this year, I think, not a clear-cut number one. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. um, like, there's not someone who, like, like maybe if Acuna was coming off an awesome year or if we more believe Judge could repeat what he did. But, yeah, anyways, this year, this year, like I said, I'm feeling five. Um, but any, I just don't want to be on a turn. I, and I don't want to be at the back end either. I think I want to be on the back end even less. But I don't, because then at the back end, I, I don't want Kohler burns. I'll wait. There's pitchers on that turn on the three, four turn. If you're on the back end. So yeah. Yeah. yeah this year, definitely. I'd love to, if, I'd love to get some middle picks and then I would do something I haven't done yet, which is a really, really deep dive on those options around pick eight. You're going to probably do that between now and Tuesday on who you want and how you want to order some of those players, because that's a real, there's a real hodgepodge of, of hitters there, whether like Kyle Tucker will be gone, but, whether you want want to go with one of the first basemen, whether you want to go with Jordan Alvarez, Bo Bichette, Soto. Right. I, there's a lot of interesting options there. I think I, I wouldn't mind if I was picking eight, I'd just spend a lot of time researching those guys. I'd lock onto one of them. And I'm, I'm locked that. onto one, by the way. Already. Okay. So perfect. I'm not going to reveal that because no. I know the dozens of people in the league that are listening to this will, you know, <laughs> use that against me and go against their own choice. No, there, there is a clear choice for me at eight. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I have a clear secondary choice. And if and those clear, two are gone, third choice, he'll be there. My third choice is less clear at this point in time, which is probably what means I'm going to get, uh, but, you yeah. know, because uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, and of course, any from the top five, I would take at eight also. But, sure. uh, so, you know, there you go. Um, I also have the third pick in the FS, uh, one of the FSGA live drafts that are going off on Thursday. I'm going to be at the FSGA conference and I'm in a 14 teamer with the third pick there. So, uh, okay. That, that'll be fun too. I'm looking forward to that. So, a couple, I, I, I'll get some drafting muscles going here, which is always great. Yeah. Pick three is an interesting, I, again, I'd rather be four or five, but yeah, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind three. I would, yeah. Also, and this is a whole other topic, but, I would not, I think I would not take Trey Turner after prepping for my draft. It's not about Turner. It's about the fact that when I went round by round, there are so many good shortstop options. Mm, it's so easy to get two and even three shortstops. I like at their ADP without taking Turner. So yeah. I just feel like if I took Turner first overall, for example, next week, that there there's going to be a point where we're going to be in about round 12 and I'm going to be out of spots to take shortstops. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And then I'm going to say, oh, I should have just taken one of the outfielders. Yeah, it depends on what you're giving up, right? You know, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're giving up some power to get Turner, basically. Yeah. I think I'd just rather take one of the outfielders or I'd rather take Jose Ramirez. Gotcha. Yeah. And just leave shortstop available. I just think there's at every point, there are interesting shortstops throughout the yeah. draft. It's that, that, that in first base. I find both of those at all points in the draft or a lot of points in the draft, they're really interesting ones at their ADP. For sure. Yeah. All right. That's going to wrap it up next yeah. time. When you hear us next, we'll be drafting live. We're going to live draft uh, labor for an hour or two or so. We'll see. We'll kind of go play it by ear. 
especially if we get a third person in the booth, that'll help us quite a bit. So uh, looking forward to that. And I uh, want to thank you guys for uh, tuning in tonight. I want to thank, of course, uh, Underdog and Fantrax for coming along with us during draft season as well. Take care. Uh, we'll get James Anderson back at you again tomorrow. Take care.